Okay, hello everybody. Uh, this is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Uh, welcome to this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. Tonight I'm continuing in the study of the book of Proverbs. I'm going to pick up where I left off last time. Uh, we're in chapter 20, beginning with verse 15. Now, if you have not seen the previous studies of Proverbs, uh, they are uploaded on my YouTube channel, Sin City Preacher. I hope you will go back and watch it from the beginning. But for now, let's go to chapter 20, verse 15. I will read it in the KJV, and then I'll also look at it in the Amplified, which is, I use kind of like a commentary. Okay, it says, There is gold and a multitude of rubies, but the lips of knowledge are a precious jewel. Um, well, I can say for me, uh, I, I certainly have come to that conclusion in my lifetime. Uh, I'll be 65 in, in three days, three days on Thursday. And uh, kind of the second half of my life, uh, I have really loved learning, attaining knowledge particularly theological knowledge, studying the scriptures. But the first half of my life, not so much. Uh, you know, I did go all the way through college. I am a college graduate and I, I did uh, succeed, but I, I never really loved the pursuit of knowledge. And I'm telling you that now, I wish I had a different attitude the first half of my life had taken learning, studying, attaining knowledge more seriously. It really is a precious gem, as it says. Um, and the scriptures, this is primarily what I study. It's, it, it is amazing that uh, this book, which, which really is actually 66 books, combined together 39 books in the old testament 27 books in the new testament altogether 66 books but there's really one message that is a a thread running through the entire bible and it's it's the message of the blood sacrifice that would be made for mankind to be saved uh, all through the Old Testament, it tells us about this blood sacrifice was needed. There are all kinds of pictures and shadows of, of this future sacrifice that would be made. I have a playlist titled The Bloody Trail. And I go from Genesis all the way through Revelation, showing all the examples of the pictures and shadows of, of, of this future blood atonement that now we know is Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the Lamb of God. Savior, the one who his blood was shed for our sins. And that's the story that runs through the scriptures. So the Bible is, is unique in a lot of ways. But the thing that I find really fascinating about it is that this knowledge that we're discussing here in this verse is there, it is unending in the scriptures. Um, I've often asked people, uh, what, what is uh, the favorite book, your favorite book you've ever read? And let's say they say, Old Man in the Sea, uh, or, uh, oh, what's that Civil War movie? Uh, Gone with the Wind. Uh, Pick any book that you think is a great novel, a great book. Then I would say, well, how many times have you read Old Man and the Sea? And even if you think Old Man and the Sea was the, the greatest book ever written, I doubt you've read it more than twice, maybe three times. And it's because you don't really need it to read it more than once or twice or three times, and you've got everything out of it you're going to get. But this book here, this, 
I've been reading and studying it daily for 29 years. And uh, if I read it for 29 more years every day, I would continue getting more knowledge, more understanding. In fact, even if you read a, a particular section of the scriptures, let's say a particular chapter, a particular verse or string of verses, and even if you've read it several times, five times, 10 times, 20 times over the years, suddenly I, I will get an epiphany a revelation from God and I finally understand something I didn't even though I read it 20 times before I didn't get it it's it's this revelation that's what is exciting um, I call them nuggets and that's what this verse here in the Proverbs is alluding to here uh, or it talks about knowledge it says there is gold and a multitude of rubies but the lips of knowledge are a precious jewel. So when it comes to attaining knowledge, it's like it, like you, you're gaining riches, you're gaining gold. And every, every time I learn something new from the scriptures, it's like a, a, a giant nugget that I've received. I hope you, if you don't enjoy learning uh, that I, someday you do and, uh, enjoy it because it, it, it is really exciting. That's one of the things I've always wondered about God is because God is omniscient, God can't learn, can he? If he already knows everything, nothing is new to God, he can't learn. So there's so much excitement in learning. I think well, I don't know, God's missing out of this excitement of learning something new. But then on the other hand, maybe I'm missing out on the excitement of being omniscient and knowing everything. Uh, I'll never, I'll never be omniscient. I have to admit that. Um, all right. I'm going to look at this verse also in the um, Amplified, see if it, how it phrases it. There is gold and an abundance of pearls, but the lips of knowledge are a vessel of preciousness, the most precious of all. Well, when it says the most precious of all, I think they're taking a little liberty, you know, that that's what the amplified translation does. It amplifies, it kind of uh, expounds, interprets, explains, elaborates. Kind of what I'm doing when I read the scriptures, I'm amplifying it according to how I understand it. And the translators of the amplified version are doing the same thing. So it's kind of like me having the translator of the amplified sitting here with me and giving them their explanation of the verse. And they say that it's uh, the knowledge is, is the greatest of all. Um, but, you know, I'm an evangelist, so I think the, the free gift of salvation is the greatest of all. And in that respect, the knowledge that is the greatest of all is the knowledge unto salvation. And I certainly am going to tell you that before this broadcast is over. What you need to know so you can be saved. Let's go to the next verse, back to the KJV, verse 16. Take his garment that is surety for a stranger and take a pledge of him for a strange woman. Hmm. Take his garment that is surety for a stranger. Okay, so a stranger can give you his garment as, a, as like a guarantee that he will come back and, or, uh, you know, if you're giving him a loan, a surety is usually like a security a promise that you're going to do something like pay off a debt uh, uh, and, and, and take a pledge of him for a strange woman. Now, I, I really don't understand how that all fits together. A strange woman, of course, is a woman you don't know. And usually the strange woman idea in Proverbs is talking about uh, having sexual relations with uh, uh, someone apart from your wife. Uh, 
that's normally how this term strange woman is uh, used. Let me look at that in the Amplified. The judge tells the creditor, take the clothes of one who is surety for a stranger and hold him in pledge when he guarantees a loan for foreigners. Okay, so they didn't even touch the idea of the strange woman there. Uh, they're just keeping it in the same context of a surety for a loan. So, yeah, there's there's other times in Proverbs, since we're on chapter 20, there's 31 chapters. We've covered a lot of ground already. And one of the interesting things about the book of Proverbs is that uh, unlike all the other books of the Bible, the book of Proverbs is not a narrative story. It's not a, a historical account of events and people. It's uh, a series of sayings or proverbs, principles, so you can learn to be wise and 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 have a good life because of, because you're wise. Um, so you could just open up the book of Proverbs, crack it open, and just start reading at any point, and and you don't need a lot of context because usually there's uh, sometimes one verse stands alone by itself it's it's a principle within one verse and the verse before and the verse after have no relationship to the to each other they're different ideas entirely whereas when we read you know in genesis and exodus and we leave matthew mark luke and john and romans and all, all these others they have their stories uh actually historical accounts of real events and real people and in those cases Context is extremely important. Context being one of the most important principles to uh, um, apply when you're studying these scriptures. To really understand that you must have context. You can take context of the verses before and after. You look at the context of the entire chapter. You look at the context of the entire book and, and, and try to determine, okay, not only the context of this, this book, but who wrote the book? Who's it, who are they writing it to? What is the primary purpose of the book being written? And then we must also keep the context of how does the book fit with the other books in the Bible, the whole context of the scripture as a whole. So context is super important. Uh, one of the most important principles to in studying the Bible, but in Proverbs, we don't really need context. Let me go to the next verse. Okay, in the KJV, it says in verse 17, bread of deceit is sweet to a man, but afterwards his mouth shall be filled with gravel. <laughs> that sounds pretty bad. Uh, I've never had gravel in my mouth, I don't think. I probably would remember it. I know I have had dirt in my mouth a little bit. I never like it, ate a whole handful or spoonful of dirt, but accidentally a little dirt's been in my mouth and it's pretty disgusting. So having a mouth filled with gravel is certainly a disgusting thing. And so that's saying that that's the result of the first part of the verse. It says the bread of deceit is sweet to a man. So deceiving, being dishonest, lying to people, leading them, uh, leading them on, uh, on purpose. Deceit is not just saying something that's untrue. It's purposely saying. Say, see, if if I told you that something and it proved later that what I said was incorrect, you could say, well, that was a lie because you told me something was factually untrue, but it's only, even though it was a lie in a respect because I told you something that was untrue, it was not deceitful because it was that was not the intention to deceive. It was just an honest mistake, an error. Uh, so um, this deceit is really what makes it bad. And it says the bread of deceit is sweet to a man. Well, sometimes people think, well, it's they kind of like deceiving people. It's a... Uh, they, they kind of get a kick out of it. Some people probably really do, really 
enjoy deceiving other people and in their minds they're they're getting a big kick out of it but it says uh, but afterwards his mouth shall be filled with gravel so i mean if you want to be a deceitful person uh you know there will be a consequence uh, how does it explained in the amplified it says food gained by deceit is sweet to a man oh okay so it's uh, the context I missed there was the food. It says, and back to the KJV, it says, uh, bread of deceit is sweet to a man. Bread. Okay. Uh, so in the Amplified, uh, it's applying that to getting food. It says, food gained by deceit is sweet to a man. Well, it would be sweet. Uh, but anything gained by deceit, you know, you, you may get, think, well, I really pulled the wool over their eyes. I really got the best of them in that uh, negotiation, that uh, haggling, and I deceived them. There's a verse uh, much earlier talking about uh, saying that, oh, you're, you're, you're in haggling. A person acts like, oh, this, this, uh, product i'm buying let's say it's a horse oh no i don't you look in his teeth and you're shaking your head and act like i'm not, I'm not real happy with that and then after you negotiate and get a good deal you walk away and brag oh he was perfect there's nothing wrong with him see that's uh some people justify that kind of negotiation or haggling but it's deceitful and and, and someday it, it will come back and there will be uh a consequence there will be uh, reaping from what you've sown um, but in in the amplify it says food gained by deceit is sweet to a man but afterward his mouth will be filled with gravel just as sin may be sweet at first but later its consequences bring despair this is a principle that I mean, it's, it's one of the most important principles for uh, uh, us to learn in life. We know that when we put our faith in Jesus and receive the gift of salvation, that we're going to go to heaven regardless of the rest of our life. Um, because the gift of salvation is irrevocable. Um, it's irreversible. So if a person puts their faith in Jesus, they receive the gift of eternal life, they're guaranteed they're going to go to heaven. But then from that moment on, they sin, they do bad things, they lie, they cheat, steal, they fornicate, they do all kinds of things. And even knowing all along that they shouldn't be doing these things, thinking that they're, they're getting away with it because they get to go to heaven. Well, it's, it's true. The, the, the consequences of sin to a believer is not loss of salvation. But there are consequences for our sins, just as it says here in this verse. Even for a saved person, you have consequences. Uh, if you decide that you're going to uh, drink alcohol every day and, you know, abuse it, and well, the Bible says don't drink too much wine. Don't drink too much hard liquor. I mean, and apparently it's telling us it's okay to have some, but if you drink too much, it's not good. So what happens if you do that? Well, you end up getting drunk. Maybe you get violent. Maybe you get stupid and break the law. Maybe maybe you end up just drinking to such a point that your, your liver is ruined, or your life is ruined, or you lose your job, you lose your wife. There's so many consequences that can, that can come out of alcoholism. It doesn't matter. I just chose alcoholism, but it could be a drug addiction. It could just be being compulsively dishonest and lying to people. What happens? The consequences, eventually, you lose all your friends and family because they no one will trust you. No, they know they can't trust you. So there are consequences for our sins, but thank you, Jesus, uh, that uh, after I got saved, I, I'm not required to live a perfect, sinless life to, to uh, get to heaven because uh, heaven was determined 
and, and settled once and for all at the moment I put my faith in Jesus. Let me go to the next verse in the KJV. Verse 18, every purpose is established by counsel and with good advice make war. Well, getting advice is a wise thing to do. Uh, many of the themes that we find each, in each chapter are recurring things. Uh, it, it, the book of Proverbs repeats itself a lot. And the idea of uh, getting advice from people, getting being counseled by other people, encouraging us to have, be willing and, and anxious to listen to other people, and and uh, it, that that theme, that that doctrine, that uh, principle, that virtue, that is encouraged over and over again in Proverbs. So if you're the kind of person that you know just thinks that uh, you, you either know it all and no one can teach you anything, it's, it's going to cost you in life. You know, you'll be better off if you learn to listen to other people, ask other people their opinions on things, you know, particularly people who are, uh, are qualified to give you advice. I mean, for example, if you, if you are going to invest some money, it's good to get advice from people who have expertise in that particular thing. If you want to uh, learn, be healthy and control your weight and eat, eat, eat properly and do the right connections, it's best to go to an expert and get advice and counsel from somebody who is qualified, who's knowledgeable in that area. Not just one person, but probably many. The, tell, the scripture also says, a wise man has many counselors. And I think that's not just many in terms of counselors in different parts of your life, like a have a counselor for your health. Have a, a counselor for your financial planning. Have a counselor for your, your Bible studies. But uh, uh, but also, it's, it's good to listen to even more than one. Don't rely entirely on one counselor because a, a variety of opinions is good for you to consider. Let me see how it's phrased in the uh, Amplified. Okay, that was... Um, 18 verse 18 is plans are established by counsel so make war only with wise guidance make war well it, this is giving us the example of making war but uh, whether it's a decision to make war uh, or whether it's in a decision of where to invest your money or it's whether it's the decision of what type of exercise would be best for you. Um, uh, the same thing applies in all these cases. And that is, it's wise to get counsel before you begin it. Now, let me go back to the uh, KJV for the next verse. It says, uh, verse 19, He that goeth about as a talebearer revealeth secrets, Therefore, meddle not with him that flattereth with his lips. Wow. There's quite a description of that person there. On one hand, in verse 18, we're talking about receiving counsel, and we want to get counsel from someone that's honest and wise. But in the next verse, it's talking about the different kind of person. You don't want to listen to this person. He that goeth about as a talebearer, that's, telling stories like say you're gossiping about people or you're making up lies about things fabricating revealing secrets that would be if someone told you something in confidence and then you go around and gossip and tell and spread the tale it says therefore meddle not with him that flattereth with his lips uh, so don't be involved with those people. If you, if once you understand that someone is dishonest or a gossip or a troublemaker, there are. <laughs> I've had, uh, I've actually had some people on YouTube that I had to disassociate from them 
for that very reason. They would contact me and want to gossip about other people. And when I told them that they shouldn't be doing it, uh, and I wouldn't participate in it, they, uh, they got angry with me and then they ended up gossiping about me. But I believe that as soon as we realize that someone is a, a troublemaker like that, just wants to gossip, and, uh, stir up strife among the brethren, that um, we need to first confront them. That's what the scriptures tell us. The first thing we do is confront them. And then if they don't listen, then you can go to get a witness to go with you and confront them. And then if they don't listen, then you have to make it public to the church. That's the, that's the protocol. I even have a video titled Protocol discussing a, a some particular problem I had and, and the proper protocol that, you know, that should be followed. Um, let me look at that in the Amplified. That is verse uh, 19. It says, uh, he who goes about as a gossip reveals secrets. Therefore, do not associate with a gossip who talks freely or flatters. All right, let's go to verse 20. KJV, whoso curseth his father or mother, his lamp shall be put out in obscure darkness. Hmm. Uh, there's a, uh, there's a, there's a, a commandment. I think it's the fourth commandment that says, honor your father and your mother. And I, I believe it says that we get a blessing if we do that. I don't, I don't think that they're uh, in the actual 10 commandments that uh, any of the verses say you're going to get a blessing, but except for that verse. So we're really told that a, a, you should really respect and honor your parents. Fortunately, you know, I mean, I'm happy to say that I've never had any any time in my life where I just, except when I was a little blue boy and I misbehaved, you know, but, but once I was old enough to understand things, you know, my relationship with my parents was totally respectful. And I'm happy to be able to say that. The same thing is true of my relationship with my son. So uh, if your situation is different and you have disrespected your parents or if you have children and they disrespected you uh, I hope that you can correct that I hope that there there can be a, a time of, of uh, healing between you but it is it says he so curseth his father or mother that's even worse than um, the, the fourth commandment says honor uh, not only are, is this person not honoring, but they're even going so far as to curse them. It says, his lamp shall be put out in obscure darkness. Now, sometimes when people, uh, when we think of our lamp being put out, we, we think of our lives being extinguished. So it could be that, uh, you know, this is talking about, hey, this is a sin that uh, you don't be surprised if, if uh, you know, God just takes your life. Uh, or it could mean that when your lamp is put out, that uh, you'll be in darkness as you go along in your life and, and you're going to be stumbling around and uh, you're going to have difficult, it's, life can be very difficult as a um, retribution for this horrible thing of cursing your parents. Let me see if the Amplified sees it the same way I just did. Verse 19, he who goes about, no, that's verse 20. Um, whoever curses his father or his mother, his lamp of life will be extinguished in time of darkness. So I think that they're interpreting the way I did, that it, it, you, may, you may end up having your life taken away from you. It's a very serious thing to curse your parents. Verse 21 in the, in the KJV, 
An inheritance may be gotten hastily at the beginning, but the end thereof shall not be blessed. I have no idea what to say about that. An inheritance may be gotten hastily at the beginning. Uh, hastily. Uh, maybe it's someone you have an inheritance and you're coming, you're, you're so anxious to get your inheritance rather than uh, giving the amount, proper amount of reverence and respect to the, the deceased and, and the mourning. And you're, you're, you're not so interested in mourning and, and sad for your loss. You're just really anxious to get your inheritance. Uh, it says that you will not be blessed if that's, if that's the case. Let me see if the Amplified, how it explains it. An inheritance hastily gained by greedy or unjust means at the beginning will not be blessed in the end. Well, this could mean that uh, that someone actually did something. Let's say they they knew that they had an inheritance coming coming, so they killed their parents or they killed the person that was going to leave them the inheritance. Uh, they were greedy and they caused it perhaps. It says, will not be blessed in the end. In other words, there is this law of reaping and sowing that will apply to you and get you. In the KJV, the next verse, 22, say not thou, I will recompense evil, but wait on the Lord and he shall save thee. He shall save thee. Well, I don't think that's certainly not talking about saving thee in terms of uh, salvation. Um, I'm pretty sure of that. I don't see any way of relating that to salvation. Say not thou, don't say I will pay back evil. Say not thou, I will recompense evil, but wait on the Lord. So that's like vengeance is the Lord's. Uh, and he shall save thee. So save thee means what? Just let the Lord do it. Uh, uh, just trust trust the Lord. He'll he'll take care of it for you. You don't need to try to get uh, recompense for evil. Verse 22 in the Amplified. Do not say, I will repay evil. Wait expectantly for the Lord, and he will rescue and save you. Okay, verse 23 in the KJV. Diverse weights in a, are an abomination unto the Lord, and a false balance is not good. That's just talking about cheating people, uh, being a dishonest merchant. If you wanted to buy a pound of grain from me and we put it on the scale, the scale must be honest. Diverse weights, it means it, it's, it's uh, not an honest weight, an incorrect measurement designed to benefit me and to cheat you. That says that's an abomination of the Lord. Verse 22 in the Amplified, no, verse 23, differing weights are detestable and an offense and offensive to the Lord and fraudulent scales are not good. I mean, I hope everybody can see that. With, just don't cheat people, be honest. Verse 24 in the KJV, Man's goings are of the Lord. How can a man then understand his own way? Hmm. Man's goings are of the Lord. Well, I can see how a Calvinist might want to grab a hold of that verse and say that the Lord's directing your movements and controlling you like a puppet. But uh, I don't believe in Calvinism. There's too much... Uh, proof that man has a free will and gets to choose, you know, his goings. And uh, it says, how can a man then understand his own way? Verse 24 in the Amplified, man's steps are ordered and ordained by the Lord. How then can a man fully understand his way? Okay. Yep. The Calvinist can certainly grab that verse. Um, if you or a Calvinist, or, or if you are being indoctrinated by, by a Calvinist, 
or if you don't know much about it, but you want to learn about Calvinism, I have a series of videos I made that are about, it's about 10 hours long. It's very thorough and it's titled Calvinism Debunked. Calvinism to me is one of the most evil philosophies ever invented. And sadly in America today, there's a high percentage, there's a good percentage, I should say, of professing Christians that are also identify themselves as Calvinists or hold some Calvinist doctrines. So if you are just learning about that, please go watch my video, Calvinism Debunked, so you can understand the evil of Calvinism. Uh, verse 25 in the KJV, it is a snare to the man who devoureth that which is holy and after vows to make inquiry. It is a snare to the man who devoureth that which is holy and after vows to make inquiry. Well, I admit I can't figure that one out at all. Let's look at it in the Amplified, verse 25. It is a trap for a man to speak a vow of consecration and say rashly, it is holy, and not until afterward consider whether he can fulfill it. Hmm. Well, I don't know how that applies to us today. I don't. I don't see anybody that I guess the closest thing I can see to that that I've experienced is uh, someone telling me that um, I, I just received a word from the Lord. I've got a word. Uh, forgot how they phrase it. Uh, they, they think that the Lord has spoken to them and they've got to, they're told to, to share it with everybody. Word of knowledge, I think, is yeah, is is the, the term they use, and I'm very skeptical of that. Yeah, but but some people think that they get this word of knowledge. God told them something specifically, and therefore, if God told them, it's as it's as as true as and as as uh, um, significant as the Scripture itself. It's thus saith the Lord. But when someone says that to me, I I will be very skeptical. I will. I will compare everything they say to the scriptures and test it by the scriptures. So I, uh, and I give the example of uh, what if uh, John says, oh, word of knowledge, the Lord said this to me, wants me to tell you this. And then Bill says, word of knowledge, the Lord told me to tell you this. And they're opposite things. They're, have you ever had people uh have different different opinions and they both say that they got it from God. I've seen that happen. That's right. You can tell me whatever you want and I'll listen, but I will go right to the scriptures and see if the scriptures say it is so, just as the Berean people did when they heard the Apostle Paul. Um Verse 26 in the KJV. A wise king scattereth the wicked and bringeth the wheel over them. Hmm. Well, that's just saying the king is going to uh, control his, uh, his kingdom. And, uh, you know, if people are wicked, they're going to suffer the consequences in, in his judicial system. Verse 26 in the Amplified, a wise king sifts out the wicked from the good and drives the threshing wheel over them to separate the shaft from the grain. So a wise king or governor or president or, uh, you know, Congress and Senate, whatever the governmental system is, uh, if they're wise, they will apply justice. Um, Verse 27, the spirit of man is the candle of the Lord, searching all the inward parts of the belly. 
The spirit of the man is the candle of the Lord searching all the inward parts of the belly. And the Amplified that says, the spirit or the conscience of man is the lamp of the Lord searching and examining all the innermost parts of his being. So from that, I, I would say that the the conscience of the man is the Lord working in our minds and are working on our conscience to examine us and, and to, to give us a conscience, to try to instruct us on right and wrong. 28 in the KJV says, mercy and truth preserve the king and his throne is upholden by mercy. Well, yes, uh, you know, if a king is good, he should be sh showing mercy to a certain extent. Mercy has to be balanced. There has to be also be justice. Um, verse 28 in the Amplified says, uh, Loyalty and mercy, truth and faithfulness protect the king, and he upholds his throne by loving kindness. Verse 29 in the KJV, the glory of young men is their strength and the beauty of old men is the gray head. <laughs> well, yeah, it seems like uh, when we're young, you know, our strength is really a, a big factor uh, in terms of, uh, in, in so many ways. People are impressed with a, a young man that's strong. Uh, he can accomplish more too than someone who's weak. He's physically able to do more things. But as we get older, the uh, what really we realize is is more powerful than physical strength is uh, the beauty of old men is the gray head. The gray head represents um, years of experience, hopefully attaining that knowledge over your lifetime hopefully gaining wisdom and then that is really what is powerful knowledge and wisdom much more so than youthful physical strength verse 29 in the case in the amplified says the glory of young men is their physical strength and the honor of aged men is their gray head representing wisdom and experience Verse 30 in the KJV says, The blueness of a wound cleanseth away evil. So do stripes, the inward parts of the belly. I don't even know what blueness of a wound is. Uh, and I mean, is that healing? Is showing that a wound is healing? And it says, So do stripes, the inward part of the belly. Stripes or getting a beating getting punished with a whip or a corporal punishment, uh, that also does uh, to the inner part of the belly. The belly is your, your, I guess, when we see the word belly in the previous verses, it was talking about your, your conscience. Let me see in the Amplified what it says about it. Blows that are, are that wound cleanse away evil and strokes reach to the innermost parts. Well, there, there is a place for corporal punishment in the scriptures. Uh, there's, there's many, many examples in the scriptures of uh, corporal punishment being used and in, 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 in being endorsed in the scriptures. Um, and and imprisonment, you know, people being restrained. There, there's criminals in, in uh, ancient uh, Israel. If, if people were uh, did something wrong, they could flee to a city, and and the city would give them sanctuary, but they had to stay there. So they were in a way imprisoned. They were not free to travel around. So in, in, imprisonment, being restricted, even corporal punishment, these are acceptable things uh, in terms of uh, justice. 
one thing that you can't find that is acceptable is torture. Uh, there's punishment is always like there's there's a capital punishment in the scriptures, and that is that is not supposed to be a long torturous process. It's supposed to be stoning, um, thrown off of a cliff, something that's that's going to kill someone instantly, uh, but not a torture torturous thing. That's why I think that eternal torment, one of the reasons I don't believe that we eternal torment is there, um, is biblical. But that's another wide subject that we could talk about for hours. If you want to know my opinion on eternal torment in hell versus um, um, conditional immortality and annihilationism, the, the, the argument between these two doctrines, uh, I have a playlist titled um, Eternal Death or Eternal Torment. So watch that and you'll see my, my, my understanding of that subject. Okay, that's the end of this chapter. This is probably a good place to stop at the end of that chapter. Uh, as, as is my custom, at the end of every broadcast, I want to give you an invitation to receive the the gift of salvation from Jesus. Now, if you don't know what I'm talking about, uh, I, I want to make it as simple as I possibly can for you uh, because salvation is simple. Um, I, want, I want you to understand how easy it is because salvation is easy. It's simple and easy. Jesus said it's, it's simple like a little child. You just be like a little child. It's that simple. And it's easy. Jesus said, my yoke is easy. To be connected to Jesus, to be in Christ, to be saved, is, is, is just easy as just being yoked. My yoke is easy. And he said, my burden is light. Uh, uh, the only thing he really asks us of us is, will you just love each other? It's, he's not putting a, 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 a long list of rules and regulations or religious practices for us to follow. He says, it, yoke yourself to me through faith in me, and, and then I'm asking you to love each other. So, yes, yeah, salvation is simple and it's easy. Uh, and here's the problem, though. The, the world today and the world throughout history has been trying to do it their way. In other words, if I said to you, what do you have to do so you can go to heaven? People have always believed that in order to go to heaven, that each person had to qualify for it. They had to, um, if they made a good enough effort and made enough progress in their life by being good enough, that God would judge them and say, well, they did good enough. They can go to heaven. And this person, no, they didn't, they, they didn't quite get good enough. I can't let them into heaven. They go to hell or purgatory uh, it's it's called the merit system but that's what people have believed throughout history that's what most people in the world today believe that's what all the religions of the world really teach is that uh, it going to heaven is a reward you you get for being a good person but the the bible says it's it's the exact opposite it, it says that that we cannot ever earn salvation it's, it's not a, a reward for good behavior. It's a gift for believing in Jesus. It's a gift. When we believe in Jesus, it's given to us, not because of our efforts, but because of what Jesus did. So that's the, the difference between the world's way and God's way. The, the world thinks that you go to heaven by <clears throat> being good enough. And that's probably what you think. If, if you're not familiar with biblical Christianity, you think, well, if I join the religions of the world and practice the religions and get really good at it and become a good person, and God will, maybe he'll think I'm good enough, let me into heaven. But I'm asking you to, right now to, to reject that philosophy. That's the philosophy from the devil. It says in Romans 10, 3, it says that there, people are trying to establish their own righteousness and get into heaven that way. But that's man's way, but it's not God's way. God's way is 
is receiving righteousness from Jesus. He gives you right, his own righteousness when you put your faith in him. So that's what I'm asking you to do is reject the old way of uh, earning salvation and now believe in this biblical way, which is receiving salvation as a free gift. Uh, but I want you to understand who Jesus is and what he's done because, so that this will all make sense to you. The Bible says that Jesus is God Almighty. And it says that he became a man. He says he's God manifest in the flesh. Uh, he became a man named Jesus. And Jesus said the reason he became a man was so he could die for our sins. And he did. He he was nailed to a cross. He suffered and died on the cross. And in that way, he paid for all of our sins. The Bible says all of our sins were charged to Jesus at that time on the cross. So uh, I've got really good news for you that, that all the sins you've ever committed in your life and all the sins that you may commit in the future, even if you try to get control of yourself and, and sin less, it, it, all your sins from your first to your last, they're already paid for because Jesus paid for the sins of the world. Isn't that good news? So now, because Jesus paid for your sins, you can have access to God. See, God's perfect and man isn't, and there was a barrier of sin, but Jesus paid for the sin, so now there's no barrier, and man and God can come together. But this can only happen by putting your faith in Jesus. So, Jesus died for our sins, the sin problem is solved. But even though he died and he was buried, after three days, he was raised from the dead. In fact, he said that he would raise himself from the dead. He said, destroy this temple and in uh, three days, I will raise it up again. He said he would raise it up again. So he promised he would raise his body back to life after he was uh, crucified and he did it uh, this is why Christianity got started this is why it's grown to where it is today it's because of this resurrection Jesus said he would give us a sign to prove his claims he saw he promised that he would raise himself from the dead and he did it and I believe it's true because there were 500 witnesses that were with him for 40 days after his resurrection, they touched him, they talked to him, they ate with him. His apostles, disciples, his brother, they all are witnesses to this resurrection. And Jesus, uh, this resurrection proves to us that his claims are true, that he is God, that he did die for our sins, that he does have power over life and death, that will he will resurrect you and me to life everlasting in heaven if we'll put our faith in him. I put my faith on him about 29 years ago. I just said, I know I can't do it. I'm, I can never be perfect. And, and that I fall short. The scripture says we all fall short of the glory of God. I couldn't do it. And I said, Jesus, I need you to be my savior. And that's what you need to do now. Call on the name of the Lord Jesus. Put your faith in him. In other words, don't try to get into heaven through your own efforts any longer. Accept defeat there and say, I need Jesus to be my savior. Depend on him. Rely on him completely. And he promises you, you will go to heaven. So you're going to go to heaven. It's guaranteed by Jesus. Once you put your faith in him, I hope you'll do it now and then make a comment on my video. So I know about it and uh, I'll pick up uh, uh, next time on the study of Proverbs. We'll pick up with the next chapter, uh, verse 21, uh, chapter 21. Thank you for watching. And I hope you will join me nightly from 7 to 8 p.m. Pacific time. Uh, thank you. Bless you all in the name of our great Savior, God, Jesus Christ.